you leave? Okay, well, he's outside. Well, good evening and welcome everyone to the October meeting of the Toronto section of the SMBT. Um, my name is Paul Briscoe. It's my pleasure to be the chair of the uh, board here and uh, welcome you to tonight's meeting. Uh, last meeting we had uh, asked for some input about uh, what you might find interesting topics. We led that off with a list from HQ and we took input from the audience as well. And we started work uh, this year, the board meeting tonight, to put together uh, upcoming meetings reflecting those levels of interest because there was stuff that people were very interested in, such as UHGTV and 4K. And there were other things that weren't so interesting but did make the list. So we're working right now to put together future meetings um, along these topical ideas. If you've had a bright idea about a meeting topic, please, at any meeting at any time, approach any one of us on the board and tell us your idea. It doesn't mean you have to do it, so you're not getting suckered in if you say, oh, I think we should do this, and it's like, oh, great, you're doing a meeting. Instead, it's more like, thanks for the info, can you help, yes, no, whatever. Okay, so um, upcoming meetings are going to reflect the input we got, and thank you very much for that. So tonight's meeting is a two-part meeting. Uh, IBC just finished uh, over in Amsterdam, and many things have not changed, and many things have changed radically. So this evening, uh, we've invited three industry experts uh, to come and talk to us about IBC. Each is going to give their impressions. Uh, and then we have a list of canned questions, because you can't do a panel without canned questions. Uh, so we get their questions that are interesting um, and, and may stimulate some useful output. But also we look to you, because when we're done with the canned questions, we'd like you to put up your hand and ask these people whatever you want about IBC or where you think things are or are going. And then the second half of our meeting, uh, we call Gadget Night. We've done this before. I must say I'm disappointed. I didn't get very many gadgets. Uh, I was really hoping that people would... Uh, have a half a dozen whiz bang funny little doodads to bring in. Maybe if I'd use doodad in the announcement, people would go, oh, I know what he means now. But in any event, um, we do have a couple of uh, industry related gadgets. They're not strictly um, about the technology we use every day, but they're applications of that technology, and they should be interesting uh, from a gadget point of view, although they're not true gadgets. But in the spirit of it, I brought a real gadget, a real, real doodaddy kind of thing. So we'll be showing that later on as well. So, my co no, my co-presenter is still not here. So, with no further ado, we have the microphone on the table. I'd like to introduce our panel for this evening. On your right, my left, Paul Steckley of Applied Electronics. Hey, hi, Paul. Hi. I'm always, I'm always thrilled when somebody pronounces my last name correctly. Is it correct? <laughs> Mr. Steckley. Um, <laughs> next, <laughs> <next, laughs> next to him, we have Stan Moot. Uh, Stan's a consultant. He worked forever for Leach Technology, had his broadcast. Uh, and a well-known uh, individual in the industry, and Randy Conrad, product marketing manager uh, with Magic Communication. So starting perhaps from right to left, we could have these gentlemen just give their little five cents on what they... Who's first? <laughs> uh, sorry. Audience right. Yeah, there you go. You Mr. Stackley first. And just go. give us your impressions on IBC, your summary of stuff, whatever you all think. So those of you who heard me talk about IBC uh, before, uh, maybe it's because I'm so busy at NAB with customers and other uh, supplier meetings that I never actually get to see, see the show. But I've been a big proponent of IBC uh, as being much more uh, consistent with the Canadian market. Uh, I find uh, over the past 15 years or so, the Canadian market has been much quicker uh, to adopt IT-based technologies and uh, all things software and automation. Uh, the U.S. market, uh, every time I go into a New York big three, as I pointed out, I think other than the Fox, I, I find the big three networks somewhat archaic uh, compared to what we're doing in Canada. So um, IBC in general is a, is a much more, I think the Canadian market reflects what's happening in Europe much more than it does uh, the U.S., and I think that has been a change over the past 20 some odd years or so. So um, I find IBC, uh, uh, it's where we go to find uh, our new products uh, uh, for applied electronics, and uh, I just find it much more consistent uh, with the Canadian market. Uh, this is a new record this year. There were 55,000 uh, uh, people at, uh, at IBC, although I did notice that they didn't do as strict uh, badge control as they do in other years. They used to put a dot on your badge, and if they saw you walking around without a dot, they scanned and put a dot on. So uh, anyways, I don't know uh, whether that's uh, uh, part of the uh, uh, expanded attendance. Um, they had something called the Connected World. Uh, there's a bit of controversy that the IBC is actually in a bit of legal action with uh, uh, the, the company that used to run the, the uh, Connected World. But it's a semi-permanent style. It's a very, very elaborate tent that they've added to increase the floor space of the ride. 
So uh, uh, once again this year, every and unlike NAB where they've had to sort of gerrymander and there's plenty of empty spaces, uh, IBC, every square foot of it was absolutely sold out. Um, the, the show is themed. So for example, the uplink and services people, uh, set -top boxes and remote controls, uh, the audio people, um, unlike NAB, which is, uh, uh, you know, NAB, the North Hall used to be called the Radio Hall, um, and then NAB decided that, that they needed to move around big company names in order to create traffic flow so that all, all the buildings, uh, uh, cynics like me say that NAB could fit into the South Hall quite nicely. Um, but IBC has, uh, since they're already, all, always sold out, so, you know, for example, Hall 7, the biggest uh, of the halls, uh, you'll see, you know, Abbott Quantel, you'll see people in the production space uh, in that middle hall. And so it's quite easy to go to find your way around. For example, I don't, we don't do a whole lot in, in RF and in tennis anymore, so uh, uh, getting to, uh, to Hall 2 for me is, is never a priority because it's, uh, uh, or Hall 3, I guess, because it uh, has that type of stuff. Um, IBC actually uh, uh, has decided to franchise. Uh, there's going to be an IBC Brazil and an IBC Dubai. It's been in the planning for a couple of uh, uh, years now, but IBC is owned by six nonprofit companies, IBM, IEEE, Simti is one of the owners of, uh, of IBC, so it's a not-for-profit uh, company. Um, I thought the uh, last year I went in search of all things production automation. I think we're really starting to see uh, some, some common themes is there's getting to be a software app to replace any piece of traditional hardware. I didn't think the 4K was as prevalent, uh, the, whole, the whole 4K buzz was as prevalent as, as NAB, but it was certainly, uh, uh, certainly there. Uh, clearly what we're seeing is the, uh, a lot of migration for software to replace all things hardware. Um, one of the, I uh, had a chat in the hall um, about uh, when uh, is the entire SDI infrastructure going to flip over and when will we be able to build a large scale network. Uh, one of the things that we went looking for and found for the first time was different types of hierarchical storage management. So imagine you've got storage silos for big files, storage silos for bursty files, storage f systems that provide a high IOPS to render out uh, the 30 to 40 versions that some say uh, broadcasters are going to have to produce. How do you manage that between routing, uh, uh, data routing, uh, between fiber channel and between ethernet? So some of the large scale tools to construct very, very big networks. Uh, virtualized software and uh, basically uh, we're really seeing sort of SDI under threat um, and I thought that uh, uh, you know IBC uh, shows more of, of the type of IT based thinking that uh, is going to replace it. I think it's about it. So. Sounds good that covers it. <laughs> so you're running uh, you mentioned over 55,000 people so it is pretty large um, and actually the show attendance was reasonably spread out. It used to be a weekend show, being the fact that it used to be a UK show, people just came over for the weekend, but really it did, it did spread out right even down to the last day, it was pretty busy. Yeah, yeah I, I actually thought it was yeah. lighter because there, were, there was less of the one or two days that was a crush and it was more evenly spread out. Yeah, it was more evenly spread and uh, they, they did used to put little stickies on your badge there, but now what they do is the badges were all electronic and they scan them. So actually it gave me a summary every booth I went to, and every paper I went to in an email, believe it or not. So that was kind of cool just to see that, because uh, normally you get followed up and this and that and whatever. Did I really go to that booth and those types of things? But that was good. Um, I, I found, uh, you're, you're right, 4K buzz might have been low, but 4K actual stuff happening was real. And I think that was the difference. There wasn't so much the 4K hype anymore. It was uh, people really demonstrating things with 4K and, and had them running. For instance, there was uh, a demo going on where, <clears throat> where they had run uh, stuff out of Rye or into Rye, uh, Italy, uh, 700 kilometers over an IP feed, and it was actually uh, 4K. I'm assuming it was Ultra HD, but everybody still calls it 4K. So anyway, uh, so those things were, were involved in that. And you're talking about HSM. Certainly MAM has had a big shift, uh, not just at IBC, but actually in probably about the last eight to 10 months, it's really taken off. People now appreciate what MAM is and how they can start to really use asset management. 
The other thing that's uh, going on is uh, OTT activity. A lot of OTT activity and for real activity as far as that goes and, and set-top boxes and that, that uh, sort of thing. But everybody talks about the switch to IP and yet when you go into Hall 1, and I think there's like 18 halls there, so I mean the show is huge. But when you go into Hall 1, it's, it's been IP for years because it's pretty well the transmission hall and uh, all the satellite uplink, downlink infrastructure and all the bits in between have been IP for a long time. All the cable infrastructure's certainly been IP for a long time. So those elements have, uh, have gone IP-wise as well. Um, looking at some of the technology under the hood there, the IABM, which is the Broadcast Manufacturers Association, uh, I do uh, associated with them in various aspects and they asked me to be one of the judges so we went through and we parsed through a lot of the technology actually selected one of the companies that you look after there which is Vitigo there oh yeah yeah as, uh, as a winner of the award there and again what they really do interesting is they've tied in a social media aspect and they've got that running really nice at, uh, at Wiley in Norway and, and how social media actually ties into their transmission stuff in a realistic manner. Uh, go ahead, Randy. Okay, uh, thanks. My focus is a little bit different for IBC being an exhibitor. So uh, as a product manager, I'm there showcasing new products. Um, it's interesting as part of that, you, you tend to meet with your technology partners, uh, bump into people who offer technology. So, <laughs> From that standpoint, you know, looking at showcasing new products on the UHD side, um, we were showing up and down conversion, and it was interesting in that the number of people who were brought to me to talk about building out UHD mobiles. So there's definite interest in UHD. I think we're past the hype, and we're starting to look at people starting to put this in. Um, another part of the technology, of course, this move to um, IP for baseband, uh, we found a lot of people coming onto the booth seeking guidance. And we had a, a technology display showing the ability to, to switch um, an SDI based router and an IP switch at the same time, um, and then showing our on ramps, off ramps. So the idea of going from SDI onto IP and back and forth. So there were there were other um, there were other areas in the show where they were showing this as well. So these the whole IP based part of it was big as um, as well. And the other part too, I didn't get out and, and actually gather this information. It was one of our R and D guys. But essentially, what we found is 12 gigabit SDI is starting to emerge now. Um, we saw seven or eight companies now who are starting to put 12 gigabit per second SDI interfaces on their product. So with that, uh, the only other thing I think I'd mention is there was an announcement by Sony on an alliance uh, for their IP Live, which would be moving around UHD on 10 gigabit ethernet. So lots happening in IP um, at the show and uh, a fair amount of UHD as well. And with that, Good. Oh, yes, I here. hope you left a million Mr. questions unanswered. Mr. Mr. Specially oh, over yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, uh, yeah, there are far fewer drones at uh, IBC. Uh, 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 it, it, it's interesting that the, 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 there's something about Amsterdam that makes everybody loose lipped. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's, um, it was interesting uh, the sense of, uh, and, and a lot of the North American uh, uh, heads of big companies, you know, big broadcast manufacturers, they're actually over there with time on their hands. And it was as, as interesting, it's as interesting at IBC what you hear uh, off the floor, so to speak, uh, as what you hear on. Uh, you know, one, one large company head who's in a position to buy other people told me there's at least 15 major names in our industry that are in play. Of course, there's the front porch announcement uh, with Oracle. Uh, while we we're there, we actually we actually heard might, might, much many fewer uh, announcements of companies changing hands than we expected the year. 
but one of the things that you can definitely see the industry changing, you definitely see the, the emergence of the, the young hip software companies and uh, uh, some of the, uh, uh, the older guard in the industry. So I, I expect much more uh, changes in terms of the uh, uh, broadcast manufacturing footprint based on what I heard off the floor. All right, press come. Why, thank you. So, I'd like each of you to answer a question in turn. What was the coolest device item you saw there? So not, you know, virtual studios, but what, what's the single coolest thing you saw? Paul? Or Randy? What, on my booth? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm not sure you can answer the question if I restricted it that way. <laughs> so, no, anywhere. Uh, within you know, the show. The, when I actually, the only thing that, that really caught my eye, I, I did get a chance to walk the floor the last day. And uh, there was the one technology area, what did they call that? The future. The future zone. zone. The future zone. The future so I, I found myself in the future zone and hadn't seen 8K yet. So that was, that was the, probably the coolest thing that I saw was, was 8K. So <coughs> cool. that. Well, I'm going to expand on that and actually tell you what you saw that was exciting about 8K. So it, it was not the fact that it was 8K, yeah, it was a huge screen and blah, blah, blah. But what they were showing was the fact that you had HDR, you had extended color range. And that was the cool part about it. So it wasn't just the, the fact that you were running more pixels on that side. And they actually, they had a racetrack scene running and they had taken it on a you know, extended color range uh, format, and then they've done the HD format. And I mean, it was just day and night. I mean, you, you would literally, you, you hear this all the time, you feel like you're there, but. So not just more pixels, better pixels. Better right. pixels, mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah. I got to say that. Uh oh, what's that? What frame rate? What frame rate? We're actually, they were running it up to 120 on, on the demo, and, uh, and they were also running it at, uh, either 50 or 60, you get a little confused when you're over there because it's all mixed up. But uh, that was the, the range they were running on. And, and they were 32. really... Mm. That's 32 HD SDI mix. Yeah. In their current model. Yeah. And, and like I say, though, they, they also had a, a little setup there, you know, a little toy setup with a, a wheelie thing going and lots of color and stuff like that going. But, and, and, uh, but actually seeing that color jump out, it was incredible. Yeah, I, I, I have to weigh in on the high dynamic range. It was interesting. Uh, there, there are a lot of studies in Japan. Uh, everything seems to uh, trickle down from NHK over there. Um, that demonstrates that the high dynamic range in HD looks better than 4K without it. And I think a lot of people have seen early 4K stuff. I've either seen an upconvert. Sorry, Randy. Uh, it's probably very good upconvert. <laughs> But, um, uh, and they say, well, I didn't really see much difference. When you see the high dynamic range, it looks more 3D. You see high dynamic range on one of the curved television sets, uh, which makes all the sense in the world, uh, for reasons I'll explain later if anybody wants to hear them. But um, uh, it looks more 3D than 3D could have ever hoped, uh, the subtle subtle shading in the depth. And so I, I uh, and does anybody know where the S, did it, does anybody know the magic frame rate they're going to try to hit with, uh, with the UHD standards? The magic frame rate is 300 frames per second because what happens at 300 frames per second? It solves all of our problems. It solves all the European and, uh, and, and North American problems, although it appears like, unless you've heard anything more, I'll hear at the conference uh, uh, next week, but it looks like they, they do want to preserve fractional frame rates, which, is, yeah. which gets boos and catcalls from the Sympy audience. Um, because they are, somebody is afraid of legacy uh, uh, upconversions uh, not working right. I'm, I'm sure there's somebody out there. Uh, and does anybody know what the maximum bit rate that's spec'd out in the SDI spec? Where it ends? I think we had this presentation here. It's 384 gigabits per second. Wow. That's, the, uh, that's the roadmap for HD SDI. Um, I, I actually thought, um, I actually thought it's not, a, it's not a cool thing, but to me, um, as we look at, at big consolidated IT, IP, whatever you want to call it, based networks, some of the control software, it was the least sexy things. It was often a white paper or brochure. There was nothing you could see. But the fact that we're getting into some intelligent systems that will manage different so bursty, big files and bursty files uh, throughout different 
you know, fiber channel, routed fiber channel and Ethernet networks. We're seeing the, the, the genesis of, of being able to construct very, very big infrastructures and the missing piece has been the orderly movement of stuff across storage arrays. All right. So you arrived at IBC with preconceived notions of what you'll see. What was the biggest surprise? What did you see that you least expected? Tell me what I didn't see what I least expected. Also counts. And again, we were just waxing on about how great 8K was. 8K was basically only on the NHK Future Zone booth. There was hardly any 8K there. And I mean, everybody's like preaching what's going on. I'm going to skip 4K. I'm going to go right to 8K. And yet 8K wasn't really around. And uh, I, I found that, uh, that kind of amazing that uh, people just, no interest in it. And I guess probably 4K has taken off so much as far as equipment. Uh, there were a few new cameras that had come out. Uh, AJA has a nice camera uh, that they have. Um, Fujinon has some nice lenses uh, they come out with on, uh, uh, for the 4K stuff. So certainly Ultra HD uh, is really going. And just a word of caution on Ultra HD, we were talking about extended color range and things like that. If you are starting to shoot anything in Ultra HD, shoot it in the uh, HD uh, uh, color format, because if you don't, you're going to need a colorist to go back and forth. I think the thing that I expected to see that I didn't see there was um, uh, we've, we've seen software replace everything. Um, I'd expected to see most of Canada still running a newsroom system by built by either you know, Avid, the company formerly known as Harris, Grass Valley, or Quantel, and I expected to see um, uh, it's close, but nobody's actually showing a piece of software that'll break that one last bastion of proprietary hardware. I, I, I saw, I thought there was a few areas of, of proprietary hardware that are still, you know, IT-like proprietary hardware that somebody's going to come out with a pure software application for. And I expected to see some of that developed. You know, I, I said the, the three years prior, I expected to see more in terms of live production automation. And now you're starting to see gobs of live production automation tools. Some, I, I didn't see as much of the facial recognition. You know, for example, the NFL has software, certain people who do the NFL uh, have, so, have software that looks at the numbers on the jersey and will track a 4K region of interest to follow the number on a, on a jersey of a player so that you don't need, uh, so I, everybody's saying yes, the facial things, being able to follow a face, being able to move a camera around and whatnot. Uh, I expect to see more in terms of that live, uh, hands-off uh, automation stuff. But um, uh, 8, 8K, I, I almost got a plate of food thrown in my face at dinner one night. Uh, uh, never sit down with a Japanese person and tell them, why are you wasting your time with 8K? Uh, 4, 4, 4K has, uh, uh, you know, is cheaper than HD. So I think that's one of the exciting things about the UHD is when we went from SD to HD, we took a big uptick in price. It's clear that 4K workflows, at least non-real-time 4K workflows, are less expensive than HD when it first came out. Ready? What surprised say after me? It's me. <laughs> what surprised you the most? The beer? Surprise. No, the beer wasn't a surprise. It's Amstel or Heineken. Right? Yeah. Two choices. Um, actually, nothing surprised me. Um, the uh, <laughs> it's kind of hard because I don't get to see the entire show and get to walk around like the, my two uh, fellow panelists here. So for me. I guess the the surprise was the interest in UHD. I really didn't expect kind of that that many people interested in it. Um, so that that was a surprise for me. Um, other than that, excellent. Greg's got the market corner before you run. <laughs> excellent. Let's take a pause and see if anybody in the audience has a probing question to ask. <clears throat> ah, probing question. Uh, just any one of the panel, uh, the extended dynamic range stuff you guys saw in the HDR stuff, was it a true HDR 16-bit display or was it more like a tone map? That kind was 16-bit. Bring out, bring out the darks and bring out, you know, squeeze the highlights. No, 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 it was a full 16-bit. Okay. I'm glad he knew because I can remember. Yeah, no. It is Amsterdam. 
<laughs> what kind of display? Was, whose display was that? Yeah. It was a full Sony setup. Oh, okay. So, but they they had uh, a little mixing and matching uh, under the hood. Right. But uh, I, I I had questioned the guy because uh, uh, when I was when I was looking at it, it, it you know it, it just looked too good, and I said, "Are you sure that wasn't?" Uh, you know, where you were shooting an extended range and then chopping it down later on just for a demo, and he said, no, they actually were, had the sensor set in each range. And, and the 8K HDR, you guys had mentioned, that was NHK? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They, that was the, the NHK demo. Yeah. They're doing the next Olympics in 8K, I swear. In 2020, they're doing it in 8K. Yep. That's yeah. what they're claiming, or Ultra HD, too. Well, that's just going to be a down version or that whatever, one, that's, that's right. But, uh, but that's the big push anyway, is to do it in 2020. And, wow. uh, and uh, you know, you maybe got your plate of food thrown at you by a Japanese guy, but they're actually hurting because only NHK is buying stuff a little bit here and there. And uh, a lot of the Japanese manufacturers are dumping a lot of money, particularly the smaller companies, in the 8K. So they're not going anywhere. Right. Anybody else in the audience? Something about IPC. We got lots more here. Okay, yeah, I, I, I would like to mention Sony. It's a, a rare day that I compliment one of our, our noble competitors, but um, they actually had a display uh, of 4K stitching technology. 4K stitching technology is getting getting very, very practical here now, and I thought it was what they did was quite neat. They they imagined two pictures that are misaligned about that much, and they actually showed uh, uh, how badly you could misalign uh, two 4K cameras and still stitch them into a seamless picture of a, a soccer field. Like they, they just basically tell it to go and the computer would correct everything. Hmm. But uh, yeah, very misaligned cameras making a contiguous 4K usable uh, stitch picture. Neat. All right, in terms of the technical papers and presentations, what was the most interesting, assuming you went and saw a technical paper, uh, what was the most interesting thing you saw presented there? And well, I did get an email. Oh, did you see technical papers? I did not. Okay. I Rand, did you see any papers? Unfortunately, no. Then Stanley won your top three. Oh, that's, that's, <laughs> that's good. That's uh, good. Let's just let's dump for the top one, and the the, the top one certainly was uh, about SDI. Will SDI survive, or the death of SDI, or something to that effect? And uh, that had a had a lot of. Uh, people on the panel, and again, Clyde Smith was on from Fox as well, and uh, they've been doing a lot of stuff in, in testing things over, over IP. There was a chap there uh, from um, Australia that had just built a complete IP facility, and uh, he, he actually didn't even want to have any multi-viewers in it, so I, I stuck up my hand, and, and he was going through everything's just bits, keep it all in bits. Don't do anything, don't look at anything. So I said, don't you have any multi-viewers? And he said, well, actually, I didn't want to have any multi-viewers, but all his uh, QA people and production people started complaining that they needed to have some. And he says, so I put some in, and now they've mainly got data displays up there telling them what's going on. But yes, indeed, they do have a confidence display at the end of all to make sure it's all real. So they're, uh, they're a distribution house, not a production house? No, well, they're not a production house, correct, except they, they are a play-out house. Right. So you, you have to say that they really have to see what's going on and have their ad inserts and make sure it's the right content and things like that. So that, to me, was a big leap of faith just to say you could do that totally all in digits and, uh, and believe that on the side of things. And there were, uh, there was a... a a good session that was done by uh, Ken Kirschbaum from the uh, sports video group and uh, on, uh, on 4K sports particularly and where, where that is going. And just like what you're saying, the stitches in there, people are doing the zoom thing. So there's a big advantage in that, certainly with the new cameras coming out. You don't have the, the different sensor size uh, lens problem that you used to do. Um, a lot of discussions. Uh, about the difference between the OTT viewerships and online viewerships between uh, uh, what happened in uh, the UK Olympics versus Sochi and, uh, and how those certainly had grown in the OTT side. And also one of the big things when it came down to OTT is actually piracy. They were talking about something worldwide of 20 million pirate 
people watching the World Cup that didn't have access to do that because of the OTT feeds going on. So piracy has actually gone back into the fold there where it's uh, very exciting on that side of what are people going to do, do about it. The other thing in the sports side was drones. Uh, yes, totally agree with you. There weren't a lot of drones there. Uh, it, I noticed the same at, uh, at Broadcast Asia in Singapore. There were only a couple of drones there, and yet the year before there was probably 30 or 40 companies that made them. And uh, I guess that's just sort of gone down to a few, but certainly that makes a big difference on how you're uh, doing sports. So then on the subject of OTT, what's happening in OTT? I mean, it started out as being a funny little thing for gas pumps and elevators, and all of a sudden now it's challenging cable distribution over the air distribution and satellite distribution. What's the evolution of OTT as of IBC? Well, one of the, one of the paper sessions was about uh, broadcast and, and uh, you know, the question, will broadcasters survive or how will they adapt? And, uh, and I think the same thing's going on over here is over there. Certainly, uh, you can tell by the, the new uh, fall lineup is the shows that had people going uh, to keep that alive. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, Netflix doesn't exhibit at, uh, at the show there. So, uh, and yet everybody's talking about Netflix. Everyone's terrified about Netflix. Cloud is a big thing. Every cloud session brings up Netflix. And of course, Amazon Web Services uh, plays out Netflix in Europe. Uh, so of course it's cloud-based, but then again, it's uh, strictly play-out activity. It's not uh, live switching. I think there's uh, th three things, and, and I've, 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 no offense to anybody using the OTT thing, I hate the, uh, uh, I think OTT is a misnomer. I, I, what I see the industry trying to do is reverse engineer uh, um, what have been compartmentalized workflows. So, you know, as broadcasters were confronted with game console delivery and still support that, Netflix, uh, VOD, their own .ca or .coms, um, everybody's created a secondary workflow. Well, guess what? The business is now under a lot of stress and everybody's looking to, I, what I, a number thrown around is the average broadcast will have to produce 30 to 40 different versions of a piece of content. Everybody's trying to get second screen content for the, the real-time uh, second screen content and secondary content. So um, I, I, what, what I see is a trend uh, starting to form. It was, it was the exciting part about some of these, if there is such a thing as calling storage silos exciting, about some of the technology to architect really big combined networks, networks that will combine the, the lo long-form high bitrate programming with the short bursty traffic. Uh, people are looking to reverse design uh, facilities and, and whole networks now. I think the, the other thing is people are looking for sec this second screen secondary content. So I think the HD uses of 4K or UHD1, the cameras are so inexpensive, you can lock them down, you can get automatic stuff to trace your favorite hockey player or whatever, um, uh, and create all that secondary content that's not in the first run broadcast. And then I think the third thing that's we're starting to see in terms of non-traditional broadcast, I see a whole cloud forming in terms of the way UHD will get to the home. Uh, HDMI has blown it. Uh, uh, it will not, uh, it, or codec, depending on codecs, it's never going to suffice, um, uh, you know, in, the, in a set-top, getting from a set-top box to a set. So now these built-in codecs that can, de like Netflix has been doing to the Samsung sets that have been out since April, uh, there's onboard software codecs in the television set. So I think that type of, uh, it's going to be at least till the end of next year before there's a set-top box solution. How eager are the head ends that have often just, some of which have just gone out to MPEG-4, how, how eager are they going to be to take all that out? and do it again for UHD, um, we may just see the whole set-top box get bypassed. And will the BDU care if they're your internet provider and your broadcast provider that they're bringing you UHD over, but not in, uh, on, a, on a television channel? So. Randy? Randy didn't get off the booth very much. <laughs> no. I, uh, over the top, those are the other product <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting. Um, just a viewpoint here. What, when I uh, when I look, like I said, I've got a different focus on IBC. Um, part of what I was displaying was the whole notion 
of when you've got SDI signals and turning them into files. So that that that's be for me being a, a processing type of uh, focused person here. All of a sudden, my new quest is wait now SDI. Yes, it's it's starting to go into a decline. There's no question there. It will be around for quite a while as this new hybrid emerges, um, especially sort of in the live television and everything. But there's a huge base of SDI out there that's going to switch over. But now it's taking all of those things that you do in those specialized boxes and turning them into software, like Paul says. And that's, that's really where, where a lot of this is going, is that it's all going to be IP, it's all going to be software based in the future, um, and leveraging all of that, that huge IT industry into the, everything we do today. And I, you know, I'm thinking of systems that have already been built out. It's interesting when you... Randy, Randy I'm sorry, can I interrupt you? Yes. The question was about OTT, which okay. is downstream delivery. Okay, well, But sorry. you touched on something when you're finished here I want to pick up on, which is software, migration of software. So go well, ahead. really, that's, that's kind of where, that's kind of got me in that direction. Um, like I said, I don't really work in over the top, so. Okay. But the whole software no, way of doing things, really, that's the technology to be able to do over the top as well, right? It's sure. A lot of software-based stuff. So, so then, to my next question, maybe you answer it first because you brought this up and Paul brought it up earlier. He called the app. Uh, the app invasion into the hardware space, what do you see, or what did you see at IDC as the latest emerging transformations of a hardware-based application now to software? And I started with, you know, automation of many computers years ago, kind of digital audio, now we do digital video on computers, and we can do more and more processes through, you know, non-dedicated hardware. What did you, what do you see migrating presently and next to the software domain for hardware? Like for example, you brought a frame rate converter. How long does that run in that pure software? It is now. When you, you look at a file-based way of doing things, it's possible to do all of these types of up-down, cross-conversion, yeah, I mean scaling. Well, yeah, we've done that for 25 years, but I mean live. Uh, that migration. The, it's interesting. The live part of it, um, the thing is, is, is doing all of that in software live is entirely possible. I just don't know if if there's the trust in doing it live yet. Well, I don't know it's possible today. Well, you could do a, a frame up-down cross-conversion real-time in software if you throw in a processor that. Who ships that? I'm not aware of a product. That's what I mean. I'm wondering when we get to that knee on the curve. I mean, it's theoretically possible, sure. There's a room full of something to do with. You know what I'm talking about? Just like the casual, oh, it's now a software app. Like Codex are a great example. Codex were hard, hard hardware not that long ago. Now you download it in your TV. Well, you can do it. You can do a real time and faster than real time file based frame rate conversion. It's entirely possible. Live on air, I don't think there's a product there yet to do that. All completely software based. What do you think is next to move to software in the chain? Um, I think it will be. A lot of this, the synchronization that takes place when you go take two videos and you need to do a switch or an overlay, it's when you've got to bring two things together and synchronize them. Moving that more and more to a software-based way of doing it and getting away from specialized hardware to do it. But that's, it, it'll still be, it's interesting, it'll still be a combination of technologies, I think. Okay. Well. <clears throat> Certainly, from the, the software point of view, people like it or not. So, you know, under the hood, it's it's everything will go that way. I'm I'm going to deviate the conversation here slightly because I think everybody might be interested to know uh, the IABM uh, with Devoncroft actually does a survey of all the attendees that uh, that go to IDC and they fill out a little form after they've done their registration. I thought you might be interested in knowing what the, uh, the top purchasing trends were be at, at IDC, and that's when people go to the show saying, I wanna buy it. So for instance, multi-platform and content delivery was one of the top items that people went to actually buy product on. 
Whereas last year it was down, I think, like number 10 or something to that effect. So you can see that's changed. File-based workflows was number two. Media asset management, three, upgrading operations, HD. So are we all HD yet? Well, the world's, uh, you know, less than half HD. Some people say, or it's 60% or whatever, but you know, it's certainly less than half from what I can see. The next one was uh, cloud computing and cloud-based servers, or services rather, and then news operations. So news operation is still not uh, that far down the list, and I think that's certainly the, uh, the cash cow. And the next purchasing was ultra HD production equipment on that side. So not to deviate too many from the questions there, but I, I think that, that kind of shows you the trend there on, on where everyone's going and, and, and how they want to get their operations going. And uh, some of those things are on the OTT side, some aren't. Uh, there was a, a panel on this, uh, one of the sports panels about what do we do for second screen? I think people are just tired of seeing sports stats on second screen. So there was a big debate on that and, and people are really confused of what they can deliver to the viewer that's useful information on second screen. And when you look at uh, sports particularly delivered in Europe, it's completely different than over here. Uh, for instance, a World Cup game, uh, on the graphics, you're just gonna have maybe the time and, and uh, the score and maybe one other graphic tops, that's it. And then you look at an NFL game over here and you've got, what, eight or nine graphics on there at the same time, so it's completely different. So second screen actually is a, a different world over there. Yeah, I, I, I think the question as to what you can do in software is you can do just about everything now. You can do your production switching, you can do your recording, you can do your slow-mo, we all know graphics happen in software, you can do transcoding. I think what, what is, you know, everything's short of a camera pretty well. I think what is, and, and there's more and more talk about uh, who's going to build the first BNC free truck, who's going to take a plunge and put a big lump of storage in and uh, processing in a truck and float everything into that, uh, um, which, by the way, would do better uh, uh, OTT broadcasts uh, because you could have those apps running as well. You could have different uh, things running for the main broadcast and your secondary feeds. So what I, what I, what I thought was lagging a bit further behind uh, than I expected, I, I'm surprised people aren't virtualizing it more. I'm surprised we still, you know, you buy a graphics box, you buy a transcoder box. I, there's nothing from a technology standpoint holding it back. It's basically a commercially driven thing at the moment. But, you know, it's interesting that news was one of your six. That was something that I, I was uh, looking for the next generation newsroom system because as the broadcast servers go away, so will their derivative news systems uh, will, will see become serviceable. But, you know, again, going back to anything you do in a truck, you can find a software app for it. Um, one of the things that I find very impressive about software, and it's not by any means new, is the ability to take in several camera feeds and frame accurately bind them uh, so that when you switch between uh, different uh, streams, you do in fact frame accurately switch between them. So you have 10 to 12 seconds of latency in one side and out the other if you wanted to do everything in software, but um, there's precious little you can't. It's just the commercial will to do so and the people taking the chance. Very good. So compared to NAB, what was different? What single thing struck you as being different? And I don't mean the European flavor versus the American flavor. I mean, had anybody built anything interesting between May and September? Wow. Well, there's, 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 one of the things that IBC is, is very good at is no whisper suites. It's almost like you're not important. Those of you who go as a, as a, as a customer to NAB, if you don't get invited to the whisper suite, it means they don't love you. Um, in, in IBC, very, very little of it is hidden. Uh, uh, you know, I can, I, as a competitor to many of the things I see, I can walk into IBC and, and get treated as well as any, any uh, 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 customer. I like the way that a lot of the component suppliers are there, so that you, uh, you know, for instance, main concepts who built a lot of the software codecs. So when one person is saying their box is better than another box, you can go drift around and find <coughs> their suppliers and ask about what rev of software codec they've got in it. So it's, I find it much easier to unravel uh, what is behind a product versus uh, 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 NAB. So there's a lot less hidden there. Um, and again, I just, I just find it much more IT-centric. Uh, 
you know, you don't really, yeah, you see the social media stuff, but it's been, a, it's been far more elevated at IBC for far longer uh, than NAB. It just seems to be a, that much ahead of the curve uh, in the IT space. Yeah, like I said, all Hall 1 is pretty well IT anyway, because it's all uh, cable and, and satellite stuff as far as that goes. And do uh, you have any comments on that? You know, what's different? <laughs> Well, you're looking at it from the uh, from the customer point of view. Well, Certainly, the, when I was on the trade show booth last year, the, the customer questions were were less about how do I fix this or what do I do with this format or how do I change these things to forward looking questions. Uh, that always seems to be the big difference at uh, at IBC. People are looking to. I, I don't think they want to stretch the bounds just because they can. Uh, they they realistically have uh, business reasons that they that they need to and there's uh, you know and, and the other thing that you're dealing with at, at, at IBC is you you have a lot of state and government broadcasters as well that uh, that we obviously don't have over here that uh, that actually have money shall I word it that way <laughs> so yes we have them here but not necessarily a lot of cash flow and uh, they they are looking to uh, to expand on that. I think one of the things I noticed, once again, this is more customers approaching me and, and commenting or asking about products is, um, with all this move to software based, and you know, we're using PCs much, much more, the, uh, the user interface, when you think of a lot of these devices, you grab a knob and you turn it. Um, a lot of that, more and more so, is moving toward a, a user interface that that's on the screen, and it's interesting in that the the notion of completely customizing that screen on a device by device basis is something that, that I'd say I found really different from NAB it was just the fact that a lot of the users of the products are coming up and asking for more of a custom approach on on this sort of thing. So that, that's one of my one of the things I noticed. Any other audience questions? 